Um, Jane, it's it, it's my uh, kind of it's my distinct pleasure to to introduce you today. And so I, I had the the uh, the wonderful opportunity to interact with Shane quite a bit at the at the ABM 2017 um, conference. And what what really struck me um, about about Shane on a personal note is that he's he's incredibly humble, but his work is incredibly good. <laughs> um, and I, I think that everyone will agree after after the presentation today that. Um, what 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 Shang is doing is uh, is is really kind of you know taking that next step forward of where um, kind of the senior agent based modelers have been saying we should be going and his work is doing that and it's doing it very well. So Shang Wu is a is a PhD student in economics at the University of Del Delaware. Um, he's going to be graduating soon um, in August of 2017 and and uh, I believe he's going to be on the academic job market then. Um, so if you have any any good job recommendations for him, uh, he'd he'd maybe be interested in in getting those. Uh, he also holds a, a master's in statistics and a master's in ag and resource economics. Uh, both of those are from the University of Delaware. So it is work. Um, he he currently works as a research assistant at the Center for Experimental and Applied Economics at the University of Delaware, and is. Relevant research interest lies in integrating experimental economics and agent-based modeling in order to incorporate bounded rationality or even simple heuristics and human decision making into agent decision rules. And um, and Shang's talk today is uh, titled uh, "Simulating Heterogeneous Farmers Under Different Policy Schemes from Experiment to Agent-Based Model Modeling." And um, I know that uh, Shang won uh, best poster. Um, and was invited to give a presentation at ABM uh, 2017 for this work. And so it's, uh, it's really wonderful that, that he's able to share this again with us. And with that, I'll, um, everyone, you know, kind of, I, I don't know how we applaud to introduce a speaker over a webinar, but um, that quiet applause for, for Shang. Thank you, Brian. Can you all hear me fine this way? I can hear you great. Can everyone else hear him? Uh, many of you are on mute, I think. Okay. Yeah. So if you cannot hear me, just uh, type in something and we'll, we'll try to figure it out. Yeah. Uh, it's a really a great pleasure to be here to share with you some of the work that I did in the past two years. And uh, currently, I'm a research assistant, as Brian interest, introduced, at the University of Delaware in the Center for Experimental and Applied Economics. And I have already defended my dissertation, I think it was in the end of May. So, um, and I, I'm already uh, hooded. So uh, I'm just technically graduating uh, this August. So basically I'm, I'm done here and I'm currently, as Brian said, I'm looking for a job and I'm open to um, the industry as well. So um, with that said, let's get into the, the study that we have been doing. Um, the, the title of this project is called Simulating Heterogeneous Farmers Under Different Policy Schemes, Integrating Economic Experiments and Agent-Based Modeling. It is a joint work with uh, Asim Zia, who is from the University of Vermont, and Meng Yuan Zhen, and uh, Professor Kent Messer, who is the director of our center and also my boss. So the funding agencies are listed below. And um, so this is a lot of um, work from different uh, disciplines and it has many different elements. So if you have any questions during the presentation, you can interrupt me. All right. So just get started with some background information. So first of all, we are from Delaware, but where is that exactly? So just some very basic background information. We are a very tiny, teeny state on the northeast part of the United States. That's where, where we are. And some more background information on water pollution. So in the United States, over 40% of the lakes are considered as impaired. 
and in Delaware, this number is 90%. So if we look at a map of Delaware, we see a lot of red with the impaired uh, waterways. When we think about water, our first impression might be a pipe draining dirty water into the river. But in fact, most of the pollution comes from non-point sources, which means the regulator cannot identify who is actually polluting. And the majority of that actually comes from agriculture runoff. And that is the focus of our study. So to give you some motivation of why we did what we did, um, we are interested in how to use information nudges to basically how to use information to help people or induce people to make better decisions. And we are mostly interested in reducing non-point source water pollution using information nudges. And the idea of information nudges originates from the social comparison theory in which Bestinger uh, proposes that humans judge the appropriateness of their behavior according to the behavior of others. And these nudges are attractive from a policy design perspective because they are very cost effective. And such nudges exist in Michigan and Minnesota where the farmers need to adopt some certain um, best practices or certain changes in their farms and in order to receive this type of verification where they can hang up and show their neighbors. And another type of um, information nudges use the narrative messages to influence people's behavior. And it has been shown that these nudges can promote environmental conservation. So what do I mean by narrative messages? Uh, for example, in a study in, uh, led by Alcott, they provided information on how individual households electricity usage level compare with the efficient level and the average level and found the information was able to reduce electricity. So on the right hand side, it shows the yard electricity usage and it shows the efficient neighbor and the, all the other neighbors averages and how you compare. So they use this type of narrative messages to influence people's behavior. And in another study, Goldstein found, uh, in another study led by actually Ferraro and his co-authors, they looked at several information interventions and found information nudges has a persistent effect in reducing water usage. And they show people the similar uh, information such as the alcohol study. They show people what average are and um, what your effective should be. And in another study led by Goldstein, they found that compared to traditional messages uh, to encourage less, water, uh, less towel usage in hotels, messages that have a more of a descriptive norm. For example, the majority of guests reuse their towels are better. And moreover, they found that messages that tie to the individual's immediate situation works better. For example, the majority of guests in your room reuse the towels. So building on these ideas, uh, we are interested in two information treatments. Information treatment one is individually targeted information on what others like you have done in the past similar situations. And information treatment two is group level information about the average decision made by the people in the same group in the last decision round. And we study the effect of these information nuggets in the context of non-point source water pollution management. So, so these are basically the focus of our um, experiment and also the agent-based model to see how we could influence people.
Jane, we're not able to hear you right now. If I can. Well, um, maybe while Shang is uh, working to get his mic uh, going again, uh, does does anyone have any um, does anyone have any questions at this point that we could field to him once he he gets his mic going? Ah, the silence of the internet. Um, so I, maybe a, an alternative question is, is, is anyone in this group using nudges in their own work? Can you hear me? Oh, yes, we can. And we've got a wonderful question here from Udita. Okay. Um, she asked, um, she, she wanted to ask a question about the, the, the second information nudge, the average. Sure. Yeah. Uh, do you, do you want to just ask your question over the over the speaker or over um, you can also type it out whatever is better for you Great, no problem at all to have to type it out. So, uh, Shang, wh why don't you go back a slide while um, so, so that Udita can reference that while she's typing her, her question. Does anyone else have any questions right now while Udita is, is typing to make sure that we're all on the same page? Great. Okay. Go for it, Shane. So um, I'll probably explain this a little bit more later. Uh, but basically, uh, people make several decisions. Um, there are several rounds. We call each round a decision. And uh, in that information treatment, people will see the average decisions uh, in, the, in the last round uh, starting from of course, the second round, because the first round, there's no average decision for the last round. <clears throat> so basically, there was, we, will ca we will take everyone's decision and calculate the averages and put, put it back onto the uh, participants' computer screen in the next round. Does that answer? Okay, great. Excuse me. <laughs> Any other questions? Or should we continue? All right. I guess I'll just continue. Can you guys hear me all right? We, we can hear you great. Thanks so great, much. Great, great. Let me know. Let me know as soon as you can't hear me. I don't know what's going on, but <laughs> sometimes the technology sometimes just not working. Um, all right. So we are at the literature, and how? So how does our our project, our study, tie into the literature? So basically, there are two fields of literature we need to look into, and the first is environmental economics. Uh, this non-point source pollution problem has been a has been with the environmental economics community for a long time because it's hard to solve due to more hazard. I don't know if you're familiar, but it means that the action of the, um, of the agents or the participants cannot be observed by the uh, regulator so that the regulator doesn't know who to punish. And Sergeantson proposed an ambient
ambient-based policy to solve this problem. So what does ambient-based policy mean? Uh, so basically, the regulator sets a target level and then takes an aggregated pollution reading from everyone in the watershed. And based on the target level and the pollution level, uh, based on the difference, the regulator uh, either charges an ambient tax or gives an ambient subsidy to everyone in the watershed. And it has been shown by economic experiments that this ambient-based policy has the potential to induce group-level compliance to the target level. Okay. So, however, uh, in practice, there has no, there has no, uh, there has been none um, ambient-based policies in the field. Uh, so, ex econ economists have relied on economic experiments to understand how these uh, policies actually work. However, if we look at the uh, experiments that have been done in the field in the past, uh, there are some limitations or restrictions. First of all, the experiments usually assume homogen homogeneity in terms of uh, both size and location of the farms. And, um, but in reality, the size and location of the farms both vary simultaneously. And second, uh, the experiments usually uh, impose a restricted decision space, which means that the farmers or the participants usually can only make one pollution decision or a one production decision. But in practice, nowadays, people usually make a production decision and also some uh, technology adoption, uh, adoption decision, so uh, such as the technology that could reduce um, pollution, some sort of pollution abatement technology at a cost. And uh, third, the experiments. Um, I don't know if you are familiar with economic experiments, but basically you have to pay, pay people real money for them to participate. And usually the scale of the experiments are very limited. I've seen like studies uh, that only use uh, three to make comparisons to do TTS, which doesn't really make sense because it's not going to be significant. And that, that is what they found. It's not significant. But a lot of it is because the scale of the experiment is too small and you cannot generate conclusions outside your the scope of your experiment. Okay. So, so we try to uh, when we design our experiment, we try to overcome these uh, these uh, challenges, uh, you know, that in the past studies. And um, in the agent-based modeling uh, literature, um, as Brian has um, introduced or talked about earlier, uh, there has been a lot of um, need or proposal to uh, incorporate bounded rationality in the agent decision rules, but um, there really hasn't been a lot of work that, uh, that actually did it. Um, so our work is based on an earlier work by Professor Zia and his co-authors uh, trying to incorporate the experiment with agent-based model, but uh, we actually try to make a closer connection between the experimental results and the agent-based model compared to the previous work. Okay. All right. I'll, uh, in order for you to understand our the experiment, I need to talk a little bit about the experimental design. Um, so, on a, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the term, but on a between subject level, which means that, um, so a little bit hard to explain, but on between separate level, which means that the people are uh, supporting information treatments. When people see one information treatment, they don't see another information treatment. That means between subject level. Uh, within subject level means that when they see some treatment, they see another, This they, the same person will see another treatment as well. That is 
call it within separate level treatment. Okay. But on a, with, on a between subject level, we have three information treatments. Well, um, two information treatments and the no information baseline. And on a, on a within subject level, we, we vary the um, complexity of the heterogeneity that was introduced to the participants. Um, and we also randomize the order of the heterogeneity. But that is just the design of the experiment and um, don't need to really worry too much about it unless you are really interested. Um, okay, so this is uh, the experiment in section, uh, a picture, picture of our lab and also the experiment. So we bring in people and I sit at the computers and we uh, they do these tasks on the computer and we pay them based on their earnings in the end. And uh, people are separated by dividers so nobody can see what others are doing and that's very important. And also nobody knows who is in which group. So th there are basically 16 people in a room and two groups and we randomize the other after each um, after each part, after each treatment. And nobody knows who is in which group with whom. Okay. And in order for them to understand, uh, is that a question? Is there a question? Or I'll just continue. Juno, why don't you uh, explain your question a little bit? Okay, yeah, I, I just didn't get very clearly is the, the term within subject level. So within subject level means that the treatment, so for example, if you have five, uh, four, four heterogeneity treatments, you do these treatments on the same person in order, right? So you have treatment, so they Shane, we just lost you. Shane, are you still there? Um, okay, so um, Shang, uh, while you're maybe getting back logged on, um, Juno, um, is the is the distinction clear? Even though he got cut off. Yeah, I guess uh, it means maybe it means uh, you have four treatments on same person, and you have four treatments in on different persons, is that right? Uh, you're breaking up a bit, but I, I believe what you said is is, is correct in, in the sense of just whether or not it's being applied uh, differences to the same persons, person versus differences between different people. So, which is what I what I think you, what I think I heard you say. That's what I mean. Cool. Uh, Thank you. James, are, are you still on? Nope, we can't hear you. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for being here today with um, and and fighting through these technical difficulties as we you know, as we work out kind of our system for doing these these webinars. Um, we'll definitely make sure that these things are are fixed up and solved for the next time that we we get together. Um, Shane, we still can't hear you.
Um, Shane, can you uh, can you hear us? Can you hear me? We can hear you great now. Go for it. Okay. Uh, it's <laughs> trying to say I don't know what's going on. Um, all right. So um, are we? So can I just can I continue now? Or? Yes, please do. This is a great place to start. So in the experiment, we also provided people with, in order for them to understand the experiment, we also provided them with this uh, type of pollution table for them to actually calculate their earnings based on the, um, their pollution based on their production and location. And also we provided them with, uh, with an interactive uh, decision calculator. So this is just for them to try what, try different decisions and different scenarios, they could assume what others are doing and they could assume what they are doing. And based on that, they could click the calculate button and they will show them their uh, earnings for that round and also their pollution for that round. And they can make their actual decisions uh, at the right bottom corner here. Okay. As I said, we provided people with uh, two information treatments, and that those information would appear uh, somewhere right above the decision calculator, uh, somewhere right here. Okay, so just a summarize of our design. Our experiment has um, two information nudges uh, between subject level. And uh, one information treatment is what someone like you have done in the past. And the other tr information treatment is what others, uh, what the average adoption and production rate in our group is in the last round. And now within chapter level, we uh, alternate the complexity uh, of spatial and size heterogeneity for each of them. And for all of the decisions, participants make two decisions, uh, you know, extended decision space compared to traditional e experiments. So they make a production decision and an adoption decision to adopt the pollution abatement technology at a cost that is also pur proportional to the size of the farm. Now, about the ABN, that's fun part. Um, so the background or the basic setup of our uh, ABM is the murder kill watershed in uh, Delaware. So ideally we should have farm level data because we are simulating farms, but we don't. What we have is parcel level data. So what we did is that we tried to calculate or simulate the farms from the parcels. And so we have these data sources and we join the parcels and to get the uh, GIS data on land coverage with location coordinates. And we went into the act census and found the farm size distribution, probability distribution for the uh, Kent County Delaware, which is where the watershed is. And we, we next generated a distance matrix which, which is the distance for each parcel we have to every other parcel in the uh, watershed. And we group the parcels into constellations based on uh, the nearest distance principle. So we group the parcels that are close to each other into farms. And we try to make sure that the simulated farms approximate the farm size distribution in the act census. So on the right hand side is what we simulated and on the left hand side is what the actual distribution is. And uh, so that's one realization on the right hand side. And we ran many different, we ran different many times and we yeah, approximate the actual distribution pretty well. Okay, so um, for the, so this is actually a little bit important, um, but I won't go into the details of, 
uh, model underlying the experiment and eigenbase model, but it's a modification of a classic game theory model. So for each agent, there is a private and each participant, there is a private earning function. And the private earning depends on the production and adoption of each farm, of not each farm, of their own farm and size of their own farm. And the private earning is positively related to production and negatively related to adoption. And total environmental damage caused by everyone in the uh, watershed is equal, is related to or depends on the production decision, adoption decision for everyone in the watershed, conditioning on the size and location of everyone in the watershed. And it's also positively related to production and negatively related to adoption. And the regulator uh, charges an or imposes an ambient based policy, which is the difference of the total environmental damage and the target level set by the regulator. And after policy private profit, it's just the private earning minus the ambient based policy, the tax, or plus the uh, ambient based subsidy, the difference of the two. And uh, we use backward induction, which is a technique in game theory, to solve for a unique dominant strategy in Nash equilibrium. So what does that mean? That means that the best strategy for the participant, and also it's a social optimal level. And so basically, it, we can treat this as the target level for the um, for the participant. So it's like the, you can think of this as the target level. All right. So in order to make sure that the conclusions we trans we generate from the experiments are transferable to the agent-based model, we make sure that we use the same underlying theoretical model, game theory model, for both of the experiments. Both, for both the experiment and the agent as well. Okay. Um, next is the, the process of our agent based model. So, an agent has two decisions the production decision and the uh, an adoption decision. And um, these decisions are influenced by the parts of a theory, which it comes from the experiment. But both of these decisions uh, influence the, um, the income of the agent and also as well as the uh, pollution. And together with the pollution of others, uh, there we calculate the total pollution. And uh, based on the total pollution and whether or not there is an ambient based policy and the, the target level of the policy, uh, the income is affected and then it in turn uh, affects the agent's uh, behavior in the next round. So how do we calculate how the agent's decision rules for production and adoption? Uh, we, use the, we use the experimental data, and they are influenced by the information they receive and the behavior type these agents are, and the size and location that agents are at. So how do we generate the behavior types? We use uh, cluster analysis. Cluster analysis is a um, unsupervised machine learning technique, and um, we use it to understand how uh, how, the, the, how many groups we could classify the agents into, because we don't actually know how many groups there are. So we use exploratory cluster analysis, and these two graphs are just um, showing two, two methods for for this purpose is to look at the data and see how you, how many groups you could classify the data into, and both of them actually suggested three groups. And we next did uh, uh, another algorithm or uh, um, approach which looked at 26 different indices, and 11 of them suggested three clusters. So that's what we did. We used we next use painting plus paint with three clusters, and we um, clustered the groups into three groups, the, the data into three groups. And if we look at data, one group is 
we call them algorithms because they are constantly under polluting and one group is constantly over polluting while the other group is polluting near the target level. Okay. Next, we look at the deviation from the target um, for, uh, to see how information, behavioral type, and size and location influence the production and adoption decision. So what does deviation from target mean? Because uh, for different treatments, the target is different. So we need to take into account kind of the average level. We need to kind of uh, demean the, the decisions for each participant. So uh, we use these two indices, percent production assistance and adoption change. We take into account the, the target level and we just we are just interested in how people deviate from the target level. And we uh, looked at how this deviation is influenced by information, size, location, and their agent type. And we put the results into the agent-based model and talk about results. So um, on the right-hand side, there's a legend. The red line means the target level and the blue line means the experiment level, uh, our experiment result. So uh, we're interested in, in the information treatment. So first of all, the overall effect of information. Uh, for under the known information treatment, we can see that the, there is kind of a gap between the experiment result and the target level. And, but uh, this gap becomes smaller in the individual level information and group level. For either, basically for either of the information treatments, this gap becomes smaller. So this means that Jane, we just lost you again. Could you reset your microphone? So um, while Chang is resetting, um, we're going to be wrapping up here um, right at 11. Um, and I, th I think Chang will have just enough time to get through everything. Um, that means that we're going to be cut really short in questions, though. And um, if uh, you have questions um, or if you would like to continue this conversation, I'd, um, I, th I think it'd be, it'd be wonderful to to continue that online um, and maybe we can, we'll, we'll set up a space and email folks about how we can continue this conversation. Chang, are you back? Uh, no, we cannot hear you yet. Shang, uh, are you are you there now? Can you hear me now? Great. Okay, perfect. So we've got about three minutes left, and then we'll um, we'll we'll wrap up. All right, that should be enough. Um, all right. So we are at the information treatment. Okay. Um, so basically, for the no information treatment, what we see is that the small farms are significantly over adopting and the large farms are under adopting. And if we look at information treatment one, the individual level information, what we find is that this gap of over adoption for small farms are significantly lower, smaller. So if we look at the top right graph over here, compare with 
the previous one, we see the gap is much smaller. And the large farms are, are doing better as well in terms of adopting, and they were not, but with information treatment, they are adopting now. And for the group level information, what we find is that the gap is smaller compared to the no information treatment, but is larger than the individual level information treatment. Right? So, so what we think is happening here is that um, under the no information treatment, because the cost of the adoption is positively related to the size of their farm. So the large farms are not willing to adopt and the small farms are over adopting, even though it's not in their best interest to do so. But for with information, they are making better decisions. But with group level information, because they are looking at the averages and it kind of serves that as an anchor for them to actually do the um, group averages, even though it might not be in their best interest, but it's still better than the no information treatment. But it's not as good as the individual level information treatment. So this basically shows that it's very important to actually consider these type of human decision um, heuristics or uh, boundary rationality in the decision making because if we, you just use utility maximization, the red line will be the actual decision rule. Okay. So conclusions. We find significant deviations at the individual level decision making and providing information treatment um, will help the policy to work better and if it's individual level information or targeted information works better than the group level information. And there are some discussions in doing this, uh, such as how do you link the experiment to the agent-based model, and how do you, and there are some limitations as well, uh, such as if you could extend this model to more complex hydrological uh, element, and also we use in university population, and that's also a very interesting discussion. Um, but sorry for cutting out frequently, uh, but that is all.